How do we test for binocular vision? Well, we've got loads of tests in our armory, but the core ones are cover tests. Would we agree with that? So let's talk about the cover test. How do we do it? We've got to choose an appropriate target, something that is going to be suitable. You also want to be thinking about the, the cover uncover test and the alternate cover test. Personally speaking, I'm a big advocate for keeping those as two totally separate entities. It's also really important to look at some of the subtleties of the cover test. So looking at the speed of movements of the eye, both the speed taken to fix and the speed of recovery. Let's also not forget that you can ask your patient questions. Now I've done quite a few cover tests and even now I would struggle to find a one diopter vertical deviation. You won't see it, but they will. So don't be afraid to ask them. This is a little infant and we're gonna do a cover test. So we're gonna do cover uncover, no movement of the uncovered eye, no movement of the uncovered eye. If we go on now and do the alternate cover test, look really carefully what happens. I just want you to watch the size of the deviation. It sort of gets bigger. Okay, so what was that showing? An exophoria. There you go, it's an exophoria, indeed. And why does that happen? It's because you're dissociating the eyes, and the more you dissociate them, you break down what is called the, the sort of um, the tonic convergence, or the tonic virgins, which is just the act of having tone in the muscles. And this is why I think it's important that you don't do your combined cover-uncover, alternate cover test, because you need to dissociate the eyes long enough to let the muscles physically relax and get the largest of the full extent of the deviation. The other thing to watch there is the instant that you take away the cover, this is the, the kind of the, the most important bit of your entire cover test is the recovery, looking for your recovery. Because what we've done here, you've created a, di a divergent squint, you've created an exotropia. That's going to cause diplopia. Diplopia is your stimulus to fuse. So if you get this diplopia that's causing this, ooh, hang on a minute, I can see that that's double, and you quickly overcome that, that's a sign of how well controlled your eyes are, so how good your fusion is. Ocular motility, there are five ocular motility systems, and we only really test one or two. And we're talking about the pursuit system. So when you're using your pursuit, you may need to be using a non-accommodative target, a pen torch. You need to be doing it slowly. The speed that you should be moving your target is up to 40 degrees a second. So it should be taking you two seconds to get from your primary position out to the extent of your movement. If you do it quicker than that, you're not testing the pursuits, you're testing saccades. Watch your corner reflections, make sure both eyes can actually see the target, look for misalignment, particularly good with young children who can't tell you if they get a popia. The other system of motility that we should be testing routinely is vergence, and this is looking at the disjugate movement of the eye. So the eye is moving not in the same direction of gaze, but in opposite directions. These are things that we do using push-up tests, and using an appropriate target, something that is has got a vertical component. And don't be afraid to sort of ask about blur points and recovery. A, a quick test would be uh, of the presence of a vergence and, and normal fusion in that way would be a 20 dot to present reflex test. It's a really useful test in young children just to prove have they got fusion or not. If you're more advanced and you want to take it on further, so you've got your fusion range, you've got your step uh, form of the bars, and you've got the gradual sort of the ramping up of the uh, rotating prisms. Let's talk about convergence. Now, it's the largest component of the vergence system, and there's a number of elements that make up convergence. So you've got things like fusional convergence. Now, that's the biggest component, and this is where the act of seeing double makes you think, oh, I don't like that and you join it up together. There's accommodative convergence, and that, as the name suggests, is secondary to how we accommodate. So it's a smaller component than fusional, but it's still quite a big component. There's also proximal convergence. That's the act of knowing that something is in front of your eyes. Tonic convergence, this is the one I was talking about, how you've got to let the muscles just relax with time. That's why you take your time in your cover test. Accommodative convergence, then, this is where you get convergence from the stimulation of accommodation, and the two are connected by the ACA ratio. You've got to think about the Rx you're giving and the influence that it has on the amount of convergence or divergence that's already there on your cover test. Kind of have in your mind that if you've got a minus, if you give minus, it makes your ESO bigger or your EXO smaller, and plus makes your ESO smaller and your EXO bigger. So think about your cover test result when you're giving your prescription. If you're testing children, you've got to get in there. You've got to be quick. As a really kind of handy rule of thumb, this formula here works really well when you're testing children. The time in minutes of the concentration they have equates to their age in years plus one. So let's have a look at an example of this. This is a three-year-old girl called Sophie. She might have a squint. So this is the question then. She's three. We've got four minutes. We've got to plan our consultation. What are we going to do to get in there? These are my goals. This is what I want to know for my consultation. Has she got a squint? Yes or no? So that's, the cover test is going to help us see that, first of all. Is she developing amblyopia, which would fit in with that? Then our appropriate visual acuity test is definitely going to fit in that. 
How are we going to manage her condition as well? The urgency of dealing with it, what we're going to give her. All of these things. This, for me, is what I'm going to use my four minutes to do. So I would do a cover test near with an accommodative target. Motility, I'm going to do with a fun pen torch. I'm going to do that to eliminate it being a Duane's or a Brown's or some other kind of mechanical condition because that would be managed completely differently from if it were a concomitant esotropia or something like that. Vision test. It's really hard to interact and engage with your child at six metres. It's much easier at three. So I would always choose to do a linear crowded optotype because we're looking for crowding. Crowding equals amblyopia. And then obviously refraction. So we're going to do our first test, a competitive target, third of a metre. There we go. But let's watch the eye movements here. There's no movement of the uncovered eye, but you could see that there. <coughs> your alternate cover test. So quick fixation, slow fixation. Quick. And then this is the recovery movement here, a really slow recovery movement. So you see that? So there was a difference between how quickly each eye fixed. So what does that tell us? Big clue, one eye is not seeing as well as the other. So even just from your cover test, you can tell what the vision is likely to be. So that then helps you plan what you're going to do next. Let's do our motility. So we've got a light. Here we go. And on an, we can still do another quick cover test. And we'll see that to a light, there's no ESO movement. OK, so already we're doing our motility, but you can still do a cover test. Watch what happens here. So we're going to do our motility. We've been going a couple of minutes now. So this is all looking quite full. And then, uh oh, how's that? I think she's starting to get a bit bored here. Right? Yeah, oh dear. Okay, now keep watching the light. I said, watch the light. Keep watching. Watch it. No, 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 no. Watch the light. Keep watching. Watch the light. No, no. Watch. Come on, keep watching. There's a big clue here. She's losing concentration. But we did get to see each of those positions of gaze. There was no mechanical deficit. There was no Dwayne's or Brown's. So that then helps us eliminate any of the, the kind of mechanical, uh, congen congenital mechanical defects. What we can then do, just as a brief refraction, so turning the lights down, and just as a quick flick with your ret, your ret reflex was quite asymmetrical. What I often elect to do for the ch a child's first ever visit into my consulting room is maybe not to do the cyclo refraction on that first occasion. You can tell this child is going to be in specs, they're going to be having lots of eye care for a long, long, long time. Do I want to completely disengender them? Do I want to completely put them off on their first visit by putting in really painful, uncomfortable drops um, that are just going to make them think, I'm never going to go in there ever again? No, I choose not to do that. I would probably call them back at some other point to complete that when they'd had a bit of fun and got them engaged in the process a bit more. This is our history here. We saw ease of, large ease of foria, um, slow fixing with the right eye and with delayed recovery. In the distance, we tried it, didn't really do very much. Motility, there was no ease of for you to light. So th these are all big clues here that this is something accommodative. Now, when we did her vision test with crowded Ks at three metres, so this is our crowded test, there was a difference here. So this was the cyclo refraction, plus eight, plus six. So what would I give? I wouldn't be taking off more than about two because the notion of making allowance for tonus, I think, is more recently been discredited and it's found that it's really there isn't anything unless you're using atropine and we're not we're using cyclopentolate what i did do in this situation is i took off my extra fudge factor so i took my 1.5 for my working distance and i took off a bit more for my kind of personal fudge factor now working as i do in the orthoptic department i would always leave a little bit of headroom because i like them to have enough plus to maintain their fusion, but to know that there's a bit more that we can give if we need it. Now, that's what I was brought up to do, and I've been reading quite a bit of interesting research recently that says that's a whole load of nonsense. You should just give the full plus altogether, and it's a lot to do with how much accommodation they've got in reserve anyway. So next year I give this, maybe that will change. But seeing what the real effect of it is, if they can maintain control with that, then all the better. So I would say two to two and a half reduction, more than that, would probably be a bit too much. So we're going to review, get them back to do the other tests that we didn't necessarily get the time to do the first time. And I think if you're going to refer, I would refer this, even though I'm orthoptist myself, I don't have the scope within my own practice. I'd be needing to charge a lot to my patients to do this. But to help the orthoptist on their way, I would always write what was the full ret and what was the Rx that I gave. Because then if 
I've given them the specs and they go to the eye clinic and they're not controlled, they know how much more plus they can give. Because if I don't tell them that, they're going to have to put the poor child through the cyclic refraction all over again to find the result that we already had. And all your cover test results, this is really kind of gold for the orthoptist. It gets them to hit the ground running. This is Dave, 42 years old. Eye strain, frontal headache towards the end of the day, starting a new job. This is our refraction, plus one, plus 0.75 here. If you didn't get your occluder out, you'd look at that as a, an emerging presbyope, slightly plus, doing a lot of close-up work. We'll give him that Rx. Move on to our next patient. So we're going to do a cover test in the distance. I've done the cover-uncover test already, and we're going to do the alternate cover test now. So an exophoria, yeah? Recovery, all right, not bad, not bad. Let's do it at near now. There's a larger exophoria, or an exo. We don't know if it's a phoria. Oh, that was a bit slower, wasn't it? You see that? Much more delayed recovery. So if we do our mallet unit for near, so there's our mallet test, and with a chance to settle down, then that's what we achieve. So with a one in right and left. We've got this exophoria, which is larger for near, and for distance. So what type of exophoria is that? It's convergence insufficiency. For the fixation disparity test in inverted commas, there was one dot to exo slip uh, HI and had a reduced near point of convergence as well. So this is a de potentially a decompensating exophoria of the convergence insufficiency or convergence weakness type. So in this case, how are we going to manage it? You want to give the minimum amount of plus. Why is that? Well, let's think back to our accommodation and convergence connections, the ACA ratio. If you accommodate less, you converge less, you diverge more. So plus increases an exo. So here you've got somebody who is already exo, already can't control it very well, and you want to put up more plus? Is that going to help them? Hmm, I don't know that it does. So in this sort of situation, this is where it's important to compare your refractive error and your cover test results to make sure that you're giving the, the appropriate amount of Rx. And it's probably more appropriate to give prisms or visual hygiene or exercises or a combination of all those things but with the least amount of plus possible for near.